Balmoral, the royal family's holiday home in Scotland. It is the most private of the Queen's residences, a romantic retreat, as far from the formality of state as it could possibly be. It is here that the royal family enjoy Balmoral traditions their ancestors created, from kilts to hunting, picnics to porridge. This retreat is key to the idea of monarchy. More than any other royal residence, Balmoral has become a proving ground. Of those who take the test, not everyone falls in love with Balmoral. If you do not like walking in the hills, if you do not like fishing, if you do not like shooting, Balmoral is not the ideal place. It is totally ill-designed for the jet set. Balmoral is critical to the royal family, uniting a diverse kingdom. It is rugged, outdoors, and, in its own way, Scottish. It was Scottishness, Scottishness everywhere. It was a tribute to Scottishness in excess. With Balmoral's tartan vision, the royal family have helped to create Scotland the historic myth. In turn, Balmoral has become a sanctuary from modern Britain, where the monarchy can enjoy an ancient world of royalty. The Highland Gathering at Braemar, Aberdeenshire. The music is Scottish, the dancing is Scottish, the event is steeped in Scottish tradition. Amidst this display, the royal family arrive. None of them was born in Scotland, yet they determinedly attend every year dressed in kilts. For them, these Scottish ceremonies have become a crucial part of being royal. Ever since Queen Victoria, there has been a strong visceral link almost between the royal family and um, the Scottish background. They were always convinced that there was a very special relationship. At the heart of this relationship is Balmoral Castle. Created as a romantic holiday home, it has come to symbolize much more. Balmoral celebrates deep-rooted values which have come to define the very essence of the British monarchy. Yet at the beginning of the 19th century, the monarchy didn't care to visit Scotland, let alone live in the Highlands. The family love affair with Scotland began with Queen Victoria. In 1842, she planned an exotic holiday with Prince Albert. It was their first trip north of the border. Scotland wasn't part of the mass Victorian tourism in, in those days, so Victoria was very much a, a very avant-garde in going there with Albert. And once they arrived there, people were absolutely delighted to see them. It was like a, like a monarch going to a sort of hidden part of China today. There, people were just delighted to see them. They'd never seen people from London before, let alone the Queen. The Times declaimed from Edinburgh, Nothing is now spoken of but the Queen's visit to her ancient kingdom of Scotland. It has superseded all other topics of the day. Victoria and Albert were received by thousands of welcoming Scots with a theatrical display of fireworks, balls, and exaggerated Scottishness. At Drummond Castle, medieval heraldry was even hired for the visit. She's also welcomed by a uh, hundred tenants who are carrying lacarbor axes, which is the, the traditional weapon of the country, that's, a, uh, that's an axe on a pole, usually about 10 feet high. Those hadn't been used in battle since the very beginning of the 18th century, and even then they were an outmoded weapon. They showed the immemorial past, the, uh, the, the highlands as a location of the fae, the extraordinary, uh, the supernatural, a strange survival who had strayed into the modern age. Queen Victoria noted, it seemed as if a great chieftain in olden feudal times was receiving his sovereign 
It was princely and romantic. Victoria was greeted by Scotland at its romantic best. There was tartan, and she said there were maidens dressed in their long gowns with flowers in their hair. It was a beautiful theme park, and even it seemed as if the, the sort of ordinary humble people lived in far more beauty than um, anyone ever could. Victoria immersed herself in every aspect of Scottishness, much to the delight of the Scots. She had her first taste of porridge, which she found very good. As for Albert, the Scottish mountains and forests reminded him of his native Germany. For the royal couple, Scotland was pure romance. Do you think there's something so potent, so irresistible about Highland Scotland, especially in terms of its sentimentalised version? It strikes all the senses and emotions. It strikes the sense of romantic history. It strikes the human sense and awareness of grandeur of scenery. This is one of the last true wildernesses of Europe, which is, if you like, an alternative to the evils and excesses of urbanism. I mean, I feel this still today, going up there. After two further trips, Victoria and Albert were so seduced by Scotland that they purchased a holiday home in Aberdeenshire, Balmoral Castle. They quickly found it wasn't large enough for the entourage. In 1852, they began to build an entirely new castle with a new design. Balmoral gave Albert the opportunity to create his own vision of beauty and perfection. It was a vision that stemmed from a German upbringing. <laughs> to me, this um, Belmont looks very much like a German castle. Uh, having been to so many German castles, I, and it looks very much like the castles um, he grew up in. It has um, the towers, it has a fairy tale element to it. Uh, it's like the Brothers Grimm. Balmoral's interior, too, was a romantic adventure, bedecked with tartan. This is a sitting room with tartan carpet and upholstery. The ballroom was graced with Gothic chandeliers and tartan curtains. Albert let rip. It was Scottishness, Scottishness everywhere. It was a tribute to Scottishness in excess. There was tartan everywhere. Everyone complained about the decor. It was tasteless, nothing matched. It was all rather excessively a kind of pre-Disney version of Scotland and Victoria and Albert thought it was marvellous. Queen Victoria wrote, The house is charming, the rooms delightful, the furniture, papers, everything perfection. Yet the tartan paradise they had created was packed with irony. Tartan was associated with the Scottish royal line, the Stuarts. Victoria sees herself, as she puts it, as the heir, as the heir of the Stuarts, the heir of that unhappy race. Her Scotland is a Scotland where she is the inheritor of a long-standing past. Despite declaring herself a Stuart, it was Victoria's great-great-grandfather, George II, who had massacred Stuart supporters, the Jacobites, at Culloden. He even made the wearing of Stuart symbols of the uprising, such as tartan, illegal. One government commentator had it in 1747 when referring to the Disarming Act and particularly to the controls over um, uh, traditional Highland uh, dress. This is an instrument for disarming and undressing those ruffians because these were regarded as, if you like, the sartorial manifestations, the manifestations in dress of disaffection, of rebellion, of treason. By the end of the 18th century, as well as state oppression, Highland people saw massive agricultural change and brutal evictions from their land. When you go to the Highlands today, People always comment upon it as a beautiful wilderness, but it's far from a beautiful wilderness. It's a derelict, derelict landscape. In Highland Scotland, because you didn't get industrialization, because you didn't get an alternative to land, it eventually brought distress, destitution, 
mass emigration, famine. Some Scots rejected the dereliction by romanticizing the old world of the rebellious Jacobites. No one did more to reinvent the past and glamorize Highland culture than the writer Sir Walter Scott, author of Waverley, Ivanhoe, and Rob Roy. There's plenty of passages that I think it's utterly forgivable to let your eye glide over. Um, there's some descriptions of Heather that I don't think I've ever quite read through entirely. Where glistening streamers waved and danced, the wanderer's eye could barely view. The summer heaven's delicious blue, so wondrous wild, the whole might seem the scenery of a fairy dream. Walter Scott himself um, remarked that what makes Scotland, Scotland is fast disappearing. Um, Henry Lord Coburn, the great intellectual lawyer, this is the last truly Scotch age. So there was a hunt on, if you like, to retain a sense of cultural identity, while at the same time retaining the Union. By the early 1800s, Scotland had become an intellectual and economic powerhouse. But Walter Scott created an intoxicating image of pastoral romance. In London, the young Victoria had become obsessed by Scott's vision. The first novel she ever read was his Bride of Lammermoor. I mean, there's no question that Sir Walter Scott sort of lit the fire in Victoria's heart that developed into her great love of Scotland. We think of this sort of dumpy little widow, but uh, that wasn't the young queen at all. You know, she was passionate about everything. And the moment she saw it, she felt she'd come home. I think Sir Walter Scott created in her a curiosity to see Scotland that, um, you know, led her there maybe the sooner. Her new husband, Prince Albert, also loved reading Scott's novels. In Germany, editions had been pirated, they were so popular. Throughout Europe, a new romanticism took hold. One German composer, Mendelssohn, had fallen in love with Scotland and befriended Victoria and Albert. Mendelssohn's Fingal's Cave is a fantasia on Scottish themes. And I think that phrase, a fantasia on Scottish themes, summarizes the whole project that Scotland was going through in the 19th century, from the Waverley novels to Balmoral. These were fantasias on Scottish themes. By 1855, the newly built Balmoral was ready to be lived in by its royal owners. Amidst this Scottish fantasy, Victoria's diary entry is lengthened, reflecting her deep passion for Balmoral. Every year, my heart becomes more fixed in this dear paradise, and so much more so now that all has become my dearest Albert's own creation, own work, own building, own laying out. But not everyone thought it to be the paradise she did. Lady-in-waiting Augusta Bruce observed with reticence a certain absence of harmony of the whole. Well, looking at old photographs, Victorian Balmoral was slightly cluttered, like all of Victoria's palaces and spaces. It was full of um, antlers and deer's heads everywhere, uh, particularly in the hall. And some of the rooms were terribly small, so that people who went to stay there um, were sort of shoved into these tiny rooms, particularly at the beginning. Um, you get ministers complaining uh, that they're forced to write their dispatches on their bed because there's no desk in their room. Uh, and, you know, there's just... <laughs> it's, a, it's such a tiny space. Comparing it to another royal home, politician Lord Rosebery observed, the drawing room at Osborne was the ugliest in the world until I saw the one at Balmoral. 